Okay. Hello, folks. As usual, we're a couple minutes early. We'll get started in just a couple minutes. Everyone's doing well today. It's a hot one out there in Arizona. 111 today. Good afternoon. We'll just start about one minute from now. I'll just go ahead and do a, a couple announcements, I guess, as we get started. Um, First off, I want to let folks know that we are going to be starting at Matthew 17 today. That's what we're up to at this point. And we'll do at least three chapters if we can, uh, maybe four. We'll see where we get to today. Uh, the other thing I want to share with folks is that, so next week, I'm going to be uh, out of town uh, when I would normally do this on Tuesday. I'm going to be gone for a couple days. We're taking a little road trip. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of camping. So uh, here's what I'm actually going to do. I'm going to offer a second session of this on Thursday, this week at 1 o'clock. Um, so I'll actually do two this week to kind of prepare for next week when I won't be there. And I will have a link uh, next week at Tuesday at 1 o'clock to redirect folks to that. So um, if you want to space them out a week apart, you're welcome to do that. If you want to get a double dose this week, uh, you can do that too. So that's, anyway, that's the uh, announcement I want to let you all know about. So two Two classes this week, uh, one today, one Thursday, and then uh, next week we'll, uh, the, that Thursday class will be a stand-in for this particular one that we're doing. Uh, good morning, hello, or sorry, it's not morning anymore, it's afternoon. Afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you all for joining, those of you that are joining in live right now and those that are watching this a little bit after the fact. Um, we are on Matthew 17 of what Jesus actually said, and this is our Bible study where we're looking specifically at the words of Jesus as a way to understand Jesus as the Word of God. And so that's what we're going to be starting with today. So if you've got your uh, Bibles out, we're going to go ahead and start there with Matthew 17. Um, and we're starting with the Transfiguration. And uh, as I said last time, this is actually very interesting because we get this sentence right at the, the last verse of the previous chapter in Matthew 16, Truly, I tell you, some of you who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom, which uh, some Christians had interpreted very strictly, very literally, as meaning that, uh, you know, that, that Jesus would, would return a second time during their lifetime. Uh, and here in Matthew, it's very interesting, that is a segue right into the transfiguration itself, where they see Jesus glorified as the Son of God, uh, essentially in the kingdom, right? So there's this way in which those things are, are connected with one another, and it may be an example of that kind of implicit humor that's in the text. Um, but let's go ahead and jump in with Matthew 17. So uh, the scene is the Mount of the Transfiguration. <clears throat> By the way, when you think of the Mount of the Transfiguration, you might think of some enormous mountaintop somewhere, you know, uh, going up to visit some hermit living on a mountaintop. Uh, like going up the top of Pikes Peak or something like that. Uh, that is not what it's like. Uh, none of these mountains, uh, especially the Mount of the Beatitudes, but also the Mount of the Transfiguration, are really much more than kind of big hills. Um, the Mount of Transfiguration in particular is not all that exciting. I've been up on the top of it. It's a beautiful place, of course, very important place, um, but you might get the wrong idea thinking about it as a, as a huge mountain. It's more of a, a hill jutting out of the landscape. Uh, and there's a beautiful chapel on the top of it as well, where I've um, 
had the great privilege of having a, a service, a Eucharistic service up there. Um, so Jesus tells the disciples in verse 7, get up, do not be afraid. Um, don't tell anyone what you've seen until the Son of Man has been raised for the dead in verse 9. So this is the kind of thing that Jesus does a lot, particularly in Mark and Matthew, where he warns the disciples not to share too much about what's happening with others, uh, at least for the moment, because he's worried that things will happen too quickly. Um, and of course, he's right about that. The authorities are going to be bearing down on him very quickly because what he's saying is dangerous and, and perceived as blasphemous. And so he wants to be careful about how quickly that is spread. Um, so I flagged that with do not fear. That's a common theme, again, that Jesus gives to his disciples quite a lot. And then discretion, again, discretion in what they share with others. Uh, in verse 11, uh, they ask him, well, the disciples ask in verse 10, why then do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? So this is about a debate over uh, who is going to be coming back. Uh, you know, who's going to return, essentially, in this promised kingdom? They're saying that Elijah will come first. And Jesus says, to be sure Elijah comes and will restore all things. But I tell you, Elijah has already come. And they did not recognize him. But they have done him everything they wished. In the same way the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. That's a really interesting verse to me because Jesus is talking about this issue of uh, both things that happened to the prophets and also his own role as the Messiah and it's you know it's not totally clear to me there whether he's talking about Elijah uh, Elijah having already come meaning the Elijah of uh, the Old Testament who we would all recognize yes Elijah's already come uh, or whether he's talking about himself in some way participating in and expanding on the role of Elijah um, and, and that he has already come I think it's the first in this particular sense I think he's saying that Elijah has already come, and they didn't listen to Elijah either, right? Um, he, he has this theme that runs through much of his teaching. The prophets have already come and given you this revelation, so you shouldn't be surprised when you see it, right? Elijah has already come, and they did to him everything they wished, and in the same way the Son of Man, meaning himself, is going to suffer at their hands. So Jesus sees all prophets as, as essentially suffering the same fate, that they are uh, rejected by their own people, and then they are eventually meet with a difficult end. Right? Uh, and it's true, pretty much all the prophets had that happen to them. Uh, so I put in there more about prophecy as well as about Elijah. Um, in verses 17 and 20, jumping to the other part of the page there, uh, Jesus is healing a boy who is demon-possessed, and he says, you unbelieving and perverse generation, he says that a lot to these, in Matthew to these folks. How long shall I put up with you? Uh, bring the boy here to me. And then he heals him, and he says in verse 20, Because you have so little faith, truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. So uh, this is one, another one of those examples of Jesus saying how important faith, faith in God for healing is and both in a in a literal sense here as well as in a, a more general sense that that our faith is going to be that source of healing for us um, especially spiritually and so in this particular case he rebukes both the disciples and really the generation as a whole for not being with it not having faith in his power to heal and God's power to heal um, and then he he does the healing himself uh, when his disciples couldn't and he says, you should have faith as small as a mustard seed, and great things will happen for you. Uh, so this is a, a really beautiful teaching of Jesus on the power of faith as well, and gives us that classic example of, of the mustard seed, right? Um, in verse 22, he's predicting his death a second time. Uh, and so the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him. And on the third day, he will be raised to life. So uh, again, he's talked several times already, again, in this mode of Old Testament prophet, he's talked about what he calls the sign of Jonah, and the sign of Jonah being the, the essentially the death of the prophet, the prophet going away for multiple days, um, and, then, uh, and then that being a sign to people, and that his life will be a similar kind of sign, that he will die and be gone for three days in the way that Jonah was gone, and then return again. 
Um, and so that, that death of Jonah is prefiguring Jesus' own death and his, the three days that he uh, is gone from the disciples before his resurrection. And so we see another example of that here, again, not explicitly tied to Jonah, but the same sort of, of prophecy about his own death. And we've seen this multiple times now, um, probably three times already in the text. Uh, there were a couple times in reference to Jonah, and then in particular this time as well in verse 23. And there was one, at least one before this as well. Uh, so I wrote that, I put a tag on that as prophecy, about prophecy or about prophets uh, and the way that they, um, well, it's a prophecy about his own death, right? So it's a prophecy about his death, his execution, his death on the cross. Uh, verses 25 through 27. So this is a very interesting interchange. Jesus is in Capernaum, which is essentially uh, their hometown. It's Peter's hometown. And the people who are collecting the temple tax are asking them to pay up for the temple tax. So this is one of the, the ways that the temple was supported, was that people pay a, a small fee to the temple for that tax. And so uh, they, ask, they ask Peter if that's going to happen, if, if Jesus is going to pay the temple tax. Um, and then they talk about it. Uh, and Jesus has this really interesting conversation with Peter in verse, it's in verse 25. What do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth collect duty and taxes, from their own children or from others? Um, and, and Peter says, well, they don't collect from their own kids, right? They collect from their subjects, from others. Um, and, and Jesus says, then children are exempt. Now, this is very interesting because essentially Jesus is saying that, that he's the son of God, right? And so who, why is the tax being collected from him? He doesn't have to pay the tax. He is exempt from the tax, right? He is the son of God. Um, he is God. And so there's no reason for Jesus to pay the temple tax, right? That's, that's essentially the argument that he's saying. And why does he have this conversation with Peter? Because Peter is the one who a couple chapters ago, we just had this interaction with saying, you are the son of God, right? So Peter is the one who's already acknowledged this. So he's having this conversation with Peter as a kind of a follow-up to that, essentially. Um, and by the way, I'm the son of God, so why would I have to pay the temple tax? But then he says, but so that we may not cause offense, go to the lake and throw out your line. Take the first fish you catch, open its mouth, and you will find a four drachma coin. Take it and give it to them for my tax and yours. So Jesus says, I'm not, I don't have to pay the tax, but in order not to give offense. So for this issue of propriety, which we've seen multiple times already in Matthew, Jesus is saying it's best if we do pay the tax so that we don't give offense, um, so that we may not cause offense is what it says in verse 27. We should actually pay the tax that we've been ordered to pay. So he has Peter go and do it. Now, an interesting thing about this is that Peter fishes to get this uh, tax, right? And then pays with that coin that he finds in the mouth of the fish. Well, Peter's a fisherman, okay? So this is the work that he does. And notice, by the way, that when Peter does this work, he is also paid. It's not just Jesus who has the tax paid. It's also Peter who has the tax paid. Peter works, and then Peter also has the tax paid uh, because he should benefit from that work, right? As Jesus would say, the worker deserves to be paid. So, a very interesting situation here where we see multiple things happening. Jesus both having a conversation with Peter about his role as the Son of God uh, and the revelation that he brings to the world. And then we see Jesus putting into practice many of the things that he has already taught. Peter is going to do work for this. Peter is paid for that very work. And they pay the tax in order to maintain uh, the propriety. By the way, if you think about this for a second, you think, well, why just four drachma, Jesus. I, I, I don't know how to translate that into modern terms, if that's $5 or $10. It's certainly not a very large amount of money. Um, why not 10 times that? Why not a bunch of gold coins in the fish's mouth, right? Uh, but that's not what happens. Instead, Jesus uh, is living a life of poverty. He's only giving what he needs. He's only taking what he needs to survive. And this is one of those things that he authorizes Peter to work for in order to pay. Right? And it's all done through the providence of God. It's not done um, in any other way. It's not done to personally enrich them. I mean, Jesus has healed all of these people, including someone just a couple paragraphs before. You would think that maybe somebody would pass him a few 
uh, a few drachma somewhere in that in that situation, right? But instead, we know that he's essentially living hand to mouth. That he's they're they're so poor that they're foraging for food in fields the way that the uh, desperately poor did in ancient Israel. And so uh, Jesus is only getting from this fish what is necessary. Only getting what is necessary. I think that's actually very important. So a lot of interesting themes running through what's otherwise a very short text. Um, so I flagged this as tax. Uh, it's also about the temple and about propriety. Um, I think I'm going to put something in there about work as well, because uh, I think there's a theme there uh, about about the work that we do and being paid for it in addition. Um, okay, uh, let's move on to chapter 18. That was a relatively short chapter. So at that time, the disciples come to Jesus and ask, who's the greatest? Truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, and whoever welcomes one child in my name welcomes me. So we're about to see several examples of this, of, of Jesus saying, if you act in a certain way towards other people, you're doing it to me. Uh, this is a beautiful example of that. Here's an example with a child. He's sort of, he's sort of um, mocking isn't the right word or making fun of, but uh, chastising, I guess is the right word, chastising the disciples for the disciples saying, you know, we're jockeying for position. We want to be better than the others. I'm, I'm number one of the 12, and this one's number two, and that one's number three, right? Uh, and Jesus is rejecting that entirely. There's no hierarchy among the disciples. He says, those of you who want to be greatest must be least. You must make yourself to be least. And this is part of that teaching around the kingdom of God. Everything in the kingdom of God is an inversion, a reversal of the way that we think things should work. Right? If we think here in this world, who is successful? The rich, the beautiful, um, the smartest, right? The people with, uh, who have inherited a bunch of wealth. Okay, um, the people given advantages, all of those people are the ones that we consider to be, you know, the best in the world that we live in. In the kingdom of God, all of those things are reversed. We've seen it several times already in Matthew with, um, for example, people who are, um, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. There was an example just a little bit earlier about, uh, oh, about wisdom, right? And he talks about wisdom and the scholars of the world and how, you know, they think they know everything there is to know about Scripture, but revelation will be given to little children, right? And here we have another example of that. He's using children as a model for the kinds of people who can enter the kingdom of God. How are children there? They're, they don't believe that they know everything because they don't. Uh, they're humble. They have a kind of open-hearted view of the world. Right? So this is the kinds of thing that Jesus is encouraging here from his disciples. Um, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. Very important. Uh, and I wrote this as about children, greatness, about sin, about sin, right? It's, it's the disciples wrestling with this issue of who is the greatest. Um, uh, actually, this, and this continues in verses 6, 7, 8, 9. So let's just look at that really quickly. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, again, making that analogy between children and those who believe in him, those who believe in the kingdom of God, uh, with a faith like a childlike type of faith, right? These who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. Very dramatic image there. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come, but woe to the person through whom they come. If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye and to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. I think, by the way, that this is very similar to uh, something we read earlier in Matthew. Let's see if I can quickly find it. Um, I think it was right after the Beatitudes. There was a very, very similar um, idea. 
I have to look that up a little bit later and see if I was right about that. Um, a lot of imagery around eyes as well, eyes and hands in that particular section, but a very similar idea. The idea that, that um, our walk with Jesus, our spiritual life, is our most important aspect of our lives, and so all other things need to be in service to it, right? Uh, every part of our body needs to be in service to it. If there's a portion of our life that's causing us to stumble, that's causing us a problem, remove that, right? Remove that thing, that stumbling block for yourself. Notice, by the way, that Jesus is keeping this focus on the person, on the individual. Uh, we're not talking here about the entire society. We're talking about individual people's spiritual lives and their walk with Jesus. Uh, and that's a theme that we definitely have seen running throughout Matthew, that idea that we should focus on ourselves uh, not judge others or worry about others, but judge and worry about ourselves, focus on improving our own spiritual life primarily. Uh, in verses 10, we start to get the parable of the wandering sheep. See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my father. Beautiful. That's beautiful. What do you think if a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, he will not leave the ninety-nine? And go to look for the one that wandered off. And if he finds it, truly, I tell you, he is happier about that one sheep than about the ninety-nine that did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. So this is an expression of God's enormous love for us, for the people whom he calls to him. And, and does not want to see any of them lost. And so we'll chase after that one even when the 99 are left behind. Um, and, and, of course, that's, uh, that's really exemplified by um, the, uh, some of the parables that Jesus taught, right? It's really interesting here. The parable of the wandering sheep. Jesus is ha God is happier about the 99 who are safely in the pen than the one who wanders away. Uh, I flagged that as uh, God. I put sheep in there as well because uh, Jesus used that imagery of sheep multiple times. Uh, and about seeking the lost. Uh, starting in verse 15, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you've won them over, but if they won't listen, take one or two others, sort of escalating the situation, so that every matter might be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses, so that's important. If they still refuse to listen to you, tell it to the church, and if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. In other words, they're not part of that community. So um, Jesus here establishes a protocol for what we would think about today as like a disciplinary measures um, that we start by having one-on-one -on -one conversation. And then we move that to a group conversation with others. And then we move that to uh, a public matter, right? And, and, and it goes through those steps. And, um, and that is the way that we should try and, and have disciplinary measures in the church. This is, by the way, I think very good advice in any sort of environment that we have, whether it's a board meeting or um, a community group or a gathering of other people, that we, we don't just sort of immediately jump to uh, making things public, but we start with private conversations to try and offer correction and then move into things that become increasingly public if necessary. Right? And here, I think Jesus really has in mind this kind of careful guidance, um, what we would think of as sort of pastoral guidance of people, rather than just uh, immediately jumping all the way to the most extreme measures. Um, and then he reiterates that line we've heard before. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. If I tell you that if two of you agree on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. What a powerful verse, right? So it's interesting because this appears to put a great deal of authority in the consensus of the church, right? That the church has the ability to make determinations about things to look at issues as they come up and in, in a collective way through prayer and consideration and debate and thought to come up with solutions for that, right? To come up with changes that need to happen. 
So it, it's saying, look, um, if, you, if you agree about something, God is going to be there with you. And he does this in the context of binding and loosing, which we've already established is part of the way that, that uh, ancient Jewish people understand the role of teachers of the law. That they have the authority to bind and to loose. That is to make things more strict or less strict in response to the situation that they uh, were faced with. But this is very, very interesting. Now, of course, if you're, if you're particularly adept at this, you might ask yourself a hard question, which is what happens when two people over here agree that something is this way and two people over here agree that something is that way? Which is the, which is the correct answer, right? Which is the direction in which you have to go? Uh, and so that's, that's not something that is immediately identified by the text to give it a solution to, but I think that's something that we should probably ask ourselves. Because, of course, Christian groups for hundreds and hundreds of years have often disagreed about matters of faith and doctrine. And so it, it brings up an interesting point uh, theologically. Um, I wrote this down. Uh, I flagged this as being about um, the church. Okay? Um, both of these rules, actually, both the first part about dealing with uh, insults from your brother or sister or dealing with issues in the church, and then also the second part about sort of church councils or the wisdom of the church. Um, it's about the church. It's about community. Uh, it's about sin, how to deal with, with sin, and also about propriety. Again, that theme coming back once more that, that things happen in a way that is respectful and careful. Uh, Jesus is, is sometimes willing to kind of throw the tables over in the temple, but oftentimes uh, he also wants to, to be careful about maintaining the right sort of public um, image that people not get the wrong idea or the wrong impression, not because he cares about what people think, but because uh, it's important that things be done in the right way, that, that there are more people be receptive to his message, I think, if things are done in the right way and done with the proper authority uh, and with the proper care. Okay, uh, next we get to the parable of the unmerciful servant. This is from Matthew 22 through 33, uh, sorry, through 35, through 35. So let's look at that next parable together. So this is in the context of Peter asking him, how much should we forgive? And he tells you, he tells them not seven times, 77 times. He doesn't literally mean 77 here either, he means as many times as it takes, right? He says, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. And at this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me. I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins, and he grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, Be patient with me, I will pay it back. But he refused and said he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he would pay the debt. And when the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged, and they went and told the master. And the master called the servant in, You wicked servant, I canceled all of that debt of yours because you begged me. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. So again, notice here, when Jesus teaches the Lord's Prayer, it says... Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. As we forgive those who have sinned against us. The implication is that those two things are joined together. Our forgiveness is predicated on our forgiveness of others. And I don't think you can make that point any more clearly than this parable does. Jesus is saying that the way that I am treating you is the way that you need to treat other people. If you are hypocrites, and this is a very common issue that he comes at the Pharisees for, if you are hypocrites and you do not treat people in the same way that I am treating you, it's not going to go well for you, right? So in this example, we have a servant who's forgiven an enormous debt, just an unthinkably large amount of money. 
and then turns around and has a fellow servant who owes him a very small amount of money or a relatively small amount of money thrown into jail. And when the master, who is God in the situation, hears this, he is furious, furious with this servant of his because he forgave him this massive debt. Shouldn't he show that to other people, right? Shouldn't he be a witness of that forgiveness and love, uh, that incredible generosity? to other people. And instead, what does the servant do? He does the opposite, right? So I, I just don't think that point could be any more explicit. Jesus is teaching here about forgiveness very strongly and saying that it is absolutely essential that we forgive others as well. So uh, I'm going to tag that with forgiveness uh, and mercy. Remember, what is the Old Testament line that Jesus has quoted multiple times in Matthew? The Old Testament prophetic line, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Jesus has quoted that multiple times in Matthew already. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. That's the way the prophet Hosea uh, recorded the words of God, and that's what Jesus is using as, um, as a teaching element here. So again, if, if, if we are forgiven, how much more should we also forgive? For us, right, everything has been forgiven for us. Jesus forgives us of everything that we have ever done if we ask for that. If we have faith in him to do that, it is, it is gone, it is washed away. We also have to forgive other people for the things that they've done to us. Those two things have to happen together. I want to be a little bit careful here because sometimes people hear this sort of blanket requirement for forgiveness um, and they can, they can sometimes use this in a way that continues to hurt people who are vulnerable. Like for example, um, someone who has been abused, uh, the abuser might say, well, you have to forgive me, right? Um, forgiveness does not mean that you expose yourself to being hurt again. I think that's very, very important. You can work towards forgiving someone for the things that they've done to you. Uh, you can forgive them of the things that they have done to you. It does not mean that you have to expose yourself to being wounded over and over and over again by that same person. So I just want to be very clear about that. Uh, this is not something that is designed to hurt you. It is like all things in the law, this is designed to help you. It's designed to help us by having us let go of those things that we have and let go of those things that others have done to us at the same time, to be free from all of it, to let go of the bad things, to let go of the, the hurtful things, to let go of the memories, let go of those things and move forward with our lives, right? We are forgiven and we are expected to forgive in turn. Okay, um, that's a beautiful parable and a very powerful one. About forgiveness and mercy is how I tagged it. Uh, let's move on to chapter 19. So uh, Jesus went left Galilee and went down on Judea, the other side of the Jordan. Uh, and they asked him about divorce. Haven't you read, he replied, this is verse 4, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female and said, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother, be united to his wife, and the two will be one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one, and therefore what God has joined together, let no one separate. And the Pharisees are a little bit uncomfortable with this. And so they say, so why is it that Moses, and they're, they're, again, they're referring to the Torah law, why is it that Moses in the Torah says that uh, we can, anybody can divorce somebody whenever they feel like it? And he says, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. So Jesus has a, as we've talked about before, because this also comes up in the beginning of Matthew, Jesus has a very direct and um, uncompromising, I think we would say, teaching about divorce, that it is not something that should happen except in extreme circumstances. And I think that's something that's very hard for us to deal with because in our culture, it's, it's relatively common, right? Um, 
I think we should keep in mind the context of this. It is spoken from the male perspective because women did not divorce men in the first century. This is not something that was even a legal possibility. Men divorced women. And Jesus is speaking about the way that people would divorce their wives and leave them essentially penniless, uh, without any support of their own, uh, leave them destitute and go off and marry someone else. So he's specifically talking about a situation where people were, as he says, hard-hearted. Because of your hard-heartedness, Moses said that you could do this. Uh, but this is not the way that you should be living your life. I think that's a little different from the way that divorce is sometimes um, necessary or unfortunately necessary in the, in the modern context. Um, because men and women now have equal rights to property, okay, and things like that. But that was not the case in the first century. So I just, I, w I really want to point that out. We can't read this purely with a 21st century lens from something that was written in the social context of the first century. Um, but I think the underlying point is actually really valid, right? What were the reasons that people might divorce one another? Do people divorce because they're just, they're just mean? <laughs> Right? Or because they, um, you know, they're looking to, uh, to, to move on and have another relationship at some point and, um, and they leave the, their previous spouse behind. And Jesus says that kind of thing is, is just not right. By the way, this is one of the only teachings that we have of Jesus about marriage and family life. There's very little about it. But there are a couple very strong teachings on divorce. By the way, Jesus' own words about divorce were so... Um, strict relatively right that Paul would later create some exceptions to this because he thought this was just a little bit too strict uh, and so we see St. Paul himself where he acknowledges the fact that it's his teaching not teaching from Jesus he says I am not the Lord say this so as a really interesting example there of jurisprudence social um, jurisprudence in the Christian first century context that we can get into but that's a whole other massive sidebar um, uh, this is about divorce, and, um, and, then, and then in a second, it's also going to be about celibacy. If we look down to verse 12, so they say, you know, if that's the situation, maybe it's better just not to marry. The disciples ask that. And Jesus says, not everyone can accept this word, but only those to whom it was been given. For there are eunuchs who were born that way. There are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others. And there are those who choose to live like eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. The one who can accept this should accept it. So uh, it was the practice, right, in, uh, in the ancient Near East that some people would be made into eunuchs. Okay, this is, it's kind of like getting, um, I mean, to just be very blunt with you, it's like what happens with a, a male dog, right? The testicles are removed. And so that was something that was practiced in the ancient Near East uh, in quite a number of different contexts. Again, it's very, very far and very alien to our worldview or our way of understanding, but it was something that happened. And when Jesus talks about those who were made that way, that's what he's talking about. Um, eunuchs who are born that way, I think you could interpret that in maybe a variety of different ways. Um, and those who choose to live like eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom, uh, I believe here he's talking about people who are choosing voluntary celibacy, right? He's talking about people who have made that choice for the sake of the kingdom, that is, for the sake of their spiritual lives and the, the, the work that they would be doing in the kingdom of heaven. So, again, very interesting passage here. Um, Jesus is both affirming the value of marriage and also saying that it's okay for people not to be married, right? I think a lot of the later medieval developments around celibacy um, in the church, particularly around clerical celibacy, celibacy of uh, monks and nuns in the medieval era, would really draw a lot from this particular verse, although it's much more heavily influenced by Greek thought as well. Celibacy is not really practiced in Judaism other than in a few specific circumstances. It was not something that was, uh, that was really done. In fact, um, in fact, I've had rabbis tell me that it's actually a sin in Judaism to not procreate. Right? So um, anyway, this is, this is something that would have been a very different, I think, from a lot of the teaching of the time. Um, people should marry 
and uh, try to marry for life, right? As, as much as it is possible to do that. And also they should, uh, if, if maybe that's not the way of life that's meaningful to them, there are other ways as well. And so he offers some other options here in that conversation in verse 11 and 12. Um, so we have here kind of a, a uh, teaching about divorce and then uh, encouragement for some people uh, to live lives of celibacy. Right. Okay. Uh, let's move on to verse 14 here. But the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. I find this is about children as well. This is very similar to the beginning of chapter 18, right? This uh, love of children, uh, encouragement of children, that children are like those who will know about the kingdom of God. Uh, verses 17 through 26. So this is a very interesting conversation that Jesus has with a, a particular rich man who says, teacher, what must I do? What must good good thing must I do to get eternal life? And Jesus says, keep the commandments, right? And which ones, he says. By the way, there's a lot of commandments in the Torah. So which commandments, Jesus? Which ones are the ones that are important? And he starts to list some of the Ten Commandments. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your father and mother, love your neighbor as yourself. And the man says, well, I've done that stuff. And Jesus says, well, if you want to be perfect, if you're aiming for more than that, go and sell all your possessions and give them to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and then come and follow me. What is this? It's an invitation to discipleship. It's an invitation to be one of his disciples, right? Come, you, if you really want that, here's the way to achieve it. And I love this. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. It's interesting that there's, there's a lot of ambiguity in the text, right? The text does not say that the man didn't do it, and it doesn't say he did. It just says he went away sad because he had much wealth. And then Jesus sees his sadness and says to the disciples, Truly I tell you, it's hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. And I really do think that was intended to be funny. And the disciples were astonished when they heard this. And they said, well, how, like, so what's, what are our options then? You know, if, if, if having wealth is such a, a hindrance for getting to the kingdom of heaven, how can he be saved? And Jesus says, with man this is impossible, with God all things are possible. Uh, let's just stop right there at verse 26. So this is about wealth and possessions and about the kingdom of God. Jesus is saying that our material wealth is a hindrance in our ability to follow him. And I think we can understand that in a very literal way, like this man who presumably did not follow up on Jesus' advice um, and instead chose not to follow Jesus, right? And I think we can read that in a way that is very applicable to our own time, that our material possessions are things which hinder our life of faith oftentimes, right? The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, as scripture says. Um, Jesus is equating people who have wealth with people who are need to, to maintain things in this lifetime, in this world. They need to keep a certain social standing. They need to look a certain way. They need to keep up with the Joneses, right? Wealth uh, inevitably also inflates the ego. You start to think that, that if you're wealthy enough, uh, I did, that I, that if this is mine, you know, it's all about me, I earned all this, when in reality all things come from God, right? And so people who are, um, have a lot of possessions sometimes have difficulty also trusting and relying on God because they're used to trusting and relying on their possessions. Wealth is one of those things that can be an enormous hindrance. That's why Jesus lived a life of poverty. That's why the disciples lived lives of poverty. Right? They, they deliberately lived in that certain way in order to be spiritually rich. And one of the dangers of living in a very wealthy country like we do is that it can make us very spiritually poor. 
we have a lot, but we don't necessarily have the kinds of things we really need, right? We have three cars, but we don't have any sort of spiritual wealth that goes with that. Uh, and, and in this particular case, for this particular man, apparently he's really struggling with that issue. And so we get that famous image from Jesus. Um, in verses 28 through 30 there, Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you that the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit at the twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. Again, the kingdom of heaven is about this reversal, reversal from the things that we know now. Things that are valued in this world now are not the things that are valued in the kingdom of heaven, and vice versa. Right. One of the chief uh, versions of that is wealth. So there's a cost to this discipleship, too. This is also about that, um, that discipleship has an actual cost that goes with it, that we're giving up something. We're giving up something for the sake of Jesus. And if we're not giving up something, why? Right? What, what have we not given up? It's a question to ask ourselves. You know, what have we sacrificed in our life, you know, materially or personally, for, for our soul, right? For the work of God in us. And if that answer is nothing, maybe there's a problem there, right? It's something to consider. Jesus says those who give the things up for his sake will receive a hundred times as much in the kingdom to come. Okay, I love this parable. The parable of the workers in the vineyard. Let's look at Matthew 20. This will be our last chapter today. The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for the vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day. And he sent them into the vineyard. And at nine in the morning, he went out and saw others. And he told them, you go and work in the vineyard, and I'll pay you. And so they went. And then he went out at noon, and he got more. And then three in the afternoon, and more. And uh, even at five o'clock, he hires more. And then when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to the foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. And the workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when they came who were hired first, they expected to receive more, but each of them also received the denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. Those who were hired last worked only an hour, and you've made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. And he answered one of them, I am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have a right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. We get it again. Now, I love this parable. I love this parable because it is about the incredible, over-the-top beauty and wonder and generosity of God's grace. Jesus is saying that it does not matter when you found that faith, when you asked Jesus into your heart, when you were saved, it does not matter. The reward is the same. The grace of God is the same. The change in our life and in our hearts and in our mind is the same. The, the rewards of following him are the same regardless of whether you do it at five years old or 50 years old. Right? The, the, the benefits that we receive are going to be the same for all people. It's part of just the generosity of God. It's a very similar idea to the prodigal son, where the prodigal son is out doing the wrong things, comes, he receives a celebration, the older brother's like, Dad, I've been here all week, <laughs> you know? I've been here all year. And his father still gives them the same treatment as if they were 
uh, equal to one another, right? The, the grace of God is so generous, it goes to everyone regardless of when they accept it, of when they receive it, of what they've done in their lives. It just doesn't matter. And that's a really hard thing for us to accept because I really think we want there to be more of this kind of karmic justice to things, right? That we, we want to say, well, I, I did a lot better, so therefore I should receive more. I said prayers every day. I should, I should receive more than that, than this guy over here who just decided at 75 to start going to church. And Jesus says, that's not true. It's just not how it works. The same generosity, the same incredible grace of God is poured out to anyone regardless of their commitment and their time. It just takes that act of faith, that willingness to say yes. And by the way, just like with the landowner, we know this ahead of time. We know this ahead of time, that the rewards are the same no matter what. No matter who we are or what we have done or how long. We have been followers of Jesus. So this is a profound parable to me about equality. And again, this goes back to that theme about the kingdom of God. The first will be last and the last will be first. Again, reversal, reversal, reversal. We've heard it over and over again now that those who um, are this way in the world will be this way in the kingdom of God. The things are, are, are flipped on their head. In God's kingdom. The way that they work here and now is not the way that they work in the kingdom of God. I think it's a beautiful parable. I really like that one. Uh, verses 8, uh, so I flagged this as about equality and grace, and of course it's a, it's a parable of the kingdom of God, and I tagged it that way. Um, prophecy, verse 18, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. And on the third day, he'll be raised to life. So this is the third time that he's predicted his death in the Gospel of Matthew. It's, well, it's the third time that he's been really explicit about it. I believe that there's been a couple others in reference to Jonah. Right? Um, in verses 21 to 23, there is an interchange between Jesus and the mother of uh, Zebedee's sons. And uh, she asks if one of them can sit at his right hand in the kingdom. And he says, you don't know what you're asking. Can you drink the cup I'm going to drink? And they said they can. And she says, you may indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my father. And the other disciples were annoyed that the, those two had even asked the question. And that their mom had been called in apparently to advocate for them. And Jesus says, you know the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. So two things here. First off, we model our life, our actions, on the life of Jesus. Just as the Son of Man came to serve, we also are called to serve others, right? And also, again, that reversal of the kingdom of God, the first and the last. This theme has been going over and over again in these parables in this chapter. It's not about the people that have it together in the here and now, the people that uh, are sort of elevated to high positions. Those people are not the ones in the high positions in the kingdom of God. So again, he's talking about that reversal that the kingdom means. All right, the, the, the way that God organizes God's society, God's world, God's kingdom, is not the way that our society here is organized. Thank goodness it's much better than that. But it doesn't mean that we won't also struggle with some of what that means. Whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. So that's a path forward for us as Christians. One of the uh, ancient ways that um, people have talked about the Pope in Rome, certainly not always the way the Pope has acted or lived, but one of the ways, one of the beautiful ways that that role was described was the servant of the servants of God. 
the servant of the servants of God. And I think that's a, a beautiful image for trying to understand what our call is as well as Christians, to serve others, right? To, to put that service, that action first in our lives, love of God, love of our neighbor, and that that is what will make us great in the kingdom of God, is that service to others, right? Not not titles we have now, not wealth or possessions or money or other things that we have now, but our service to others is that thing which, uh, which God knows and will judge us for. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And finally, we have one last verse here. He heals two blind men. Um, two blind men are sitting by the roadside, and they appeal to Jesus. Um, they're shouting out, Jesus, have mercy. And the crowd is shouting for them to be quiet. And he says, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, we want our sight. Jesus had compassion on them, touched their eyes, and immediately their sight was restored. Again, their faith. Their faith. They call out to Jesus. They they, the crowd is shouting them down. The crowd is telling them to shut up and be quiet. And they're calling out to Jesus, Lord, heal us, please. We have faith in you. And it's that faith in him that leads to healing. All of which is a symbol of our spiritual life. Our souls are broken and wounded and hurt. And we need to call to Jesus, have faith in him to heal that which we bring, to heal that brokenness in us, to heal that part of us that is not worthy of the kingdom of heaven, to transform us to be more like him, to help us follow him and follow his example. And Jesus will heal. Jesus will restore us and bring us home. So we're going to end there today. Uh, we're almost at our time, and so I don't want to run too far out. We've ended at the end of chapter 20. Just a reminder, I will not be doing this live next week. Instead, what I'm going to do is I will record this on Thursday, two days from now, um, in 48 hours. I'm going to do another one of these on Thursday at 1 o'clock. You're welcome to tune in live for that as well. Um, however, what I'll try and do is get that posted up on Facebook, um, and then I will link back to that uh, next Tuesday so that if folks still want to keep a space of a, a month, I'm sorry, a week between these, they're welcome to do that. Um, so we will resume this Thursday as a substitute for next Tuesday um, at one o'clock as well, this coming Thursday. Um, and we'll do several chapters here as well. We've got a couple that are pretty, pretty thick with teachings of Jesus. So we'll see how far we can go, at least another three chapters or so on Thursday afternoon. Uh, thank you all so much for joining in, and I hope this has been interesting to you. You've received something from it, some things to think on, some things that uh, will lead to further exploration in your own spiritual life. Um, and I just hope that, uh, that that faith grows inside of you and continues to blossom, um, and that you look to, to Jesus, who is the one who can heal us in every way. Take care and have a good day.